Hello, welcome to how to replace a custom database using Redis Gears or Die Trying. If you are here today, because this is kind of a snappy title, I should go back and thank my 11th grade English teacher who gave just a little bit of extra credit if you had a funny title on your paper. He said this would be useful and helpful in other ways in the rest of my life, and I think he was right, because we're all here today. Uh, first, we're going to roll back about 10 years uh, to build up this story that I'm going to tell. Um, 10 years ago, uh, we were a young, foolish, kind of broke company, and we built a custom database. We called it Cascabel. Uh, and then we pretty much immediately started to take it for granted. Um, we didn't really want to be a database company. We wanted to be a data company. We wanted to build products on top of the data. Um, year by year, we accrued more and more technical data that on that database itself. Uh, and then now at this point, we just kind of want to move on. Now, if this in any way sounds like a relationship or marriage that's gone off the rails, it's completely coincidental. Though, if this story helps you in your professional or personal life, uh, let me know. I'm Will. I don't look like that anymore. My youngest is very disappointed about that. He asked me to grow back the beard every single day. There's a common thread uh, into my work history, which I didn't really put here, but you know, you can look me up on LinkedIn. Um, a lot of startups, uh, they all have a common thread of kind of pushing uh, some sort of technological limit. First, it was a wearable fitness company and trying to deal with multiple sensors producing tons of data. Uh, an enterprise search company uh, crawling internal enterprise systems and trying to index and deal with all the data that came out of it, and now civic science. And civic science provides fast and forward-looking consumer intelligence. Now, there's a lot more text on this slide, and please take your time, read it, and maybe look at it later, but I figured that it does such a good job of demonstrating the kinds of customers we have and the value we provide to those customers I don't need to restate it. And the reality is, is that this is a technical conference and you probably are more interested in how than what. So I'll just bounce over for a little bit of show and tell. So imagine it's the morning, drinking a cup of coffee and have a time machine and go back about a month in time. And the big news is that there's this ship stuck in the Suez Canal. And you know, I'm on here on msn.com and I'm reading about it. And then, oh, here we go. Here's a question. So this is the first sort of pillar of the company and it's this uh, Venn diagram overlap between our publisher partners like MSN and a respondent like myself. So I go and I'm like, well, I think this is going to be clear the next week. No, not so much. Now, first of all, we immediately uh, don't save anything to our systems uh, until you can either look at our privacy policy, terms of service, agree, disagree. Even if you agree, um, you can go back in any time, export your history, mutate it, clear it, whatever. We want to be like responsible about the data we collect. Um, I quickly just refresh the page uh, to skip out of the cycle of it, just to show the fact that if you would go through at the end, you get some results. Um, and we all know how this turned out, right? Uh, in addition to just simple results, uh, people that answer our polls, depending on what site it's on and the kind of questions, we might also provide some like interesting factoids right underneath as well. Now, another major uh, pillar of the company is more on the B2B side. So I'll flip over here. This is the Insight Store. Um, and namely, it's the Insight Store where I've um, filtered out some of our ghost questions. Now, I want to be clear. We are not a primarily ghost-based company. Uh, it just so happens that we ask lots and lots of questions. So we happen to have a lot of questions about ghosts and, quite frankly, everything. Now, we could click on any one of these. I've opened up some tabs just to make it easier on myself. And in this case, this is, have you ever seen a ghost? with a uh, breakdown by geography, namely state. And we can see a fun little pattern here, which uh, if it's hard to tell, Alaska being blue means yes. So there's one thing that we can take from this data. Alaska is clearly haunted. Now, this is just one thing you could do. It gets ever deeper and I won't go into everything, but like you could take any question or system and compare with anything else. So in this case, it's have you ever seen a ghost versus do you have like, a, like an IRA or other sort of retirement fund. And there's a pretty strong correlation between the fact that people who have seen ghosts don't have one and the people that uh, have not seen ghosts do have one. I'll let you draw your own conclusions from there. Um, but that's just a, a quick taste of the kind of things we do. And we're able to do this because again, as you can see on the right, we're on thousands of websites. We're asking hundreds of questions every day. We're gathering millions and millions of responses every day. And at this point, we have hundreds of millions of profiles that we're building up. So 
Let's get back to the story though. Why do we build a database? How do we build a database? Well, you know, we saw that Insight Store and early on when we had the early prototypes of the Insight Store, as engineers, we would watch how our internal um, employees or prototypical customers were using it. And we were kind of hoping to see certain patterns because like given a database, those patterns would lend themselves to certain maybe caching strategies or indexing. But the reality was there was never one. It was extremely ad hoc and random. In addition, we had a large volumes of data already starting to come in, and everyone wanted the results to be in real time effectively, or if at, at the very worst, like fresh time, like within the last few minutes. And so, you know, you added up all these constraints, and there was just nothing that was like working for us. And I have to admit right now that I'm kind of terrified that at any point in time, someone will be like, well, why didn't you just do blank? Because, you know, at this point, you know, I've put a lot of time and effort and money into thinking about these kind of issues. And my hope is that by over constraining the problem, my solution is the only one that could possibly exist. Uh, in this case, you know, we made um, this thing called Cascabel. And, you know, some of the ingredients were we used Java, we had memory map files, there were sparse bitmaps, it was a distributed architecture, you know, and it worked. As I said before, we built an entire company over it. Uh, and, you know, it seemed pretty expensive, but you know, if you're into economics, there were some externalities. I mean, yes, there's the salaries of the people that built it, but also year by year, we started to take on risk by not really maintaining it, which, you know, again, we sort of immediately started to do. So uh, a couple years into the story, you know, at this point, you know, we've already been neglected a little bit and we know that we kind of want to replace it. So at this point, it's more of like a keeping an eye out metaphor of a replacement. Um, and then a few more years pass, and at this point we're like, you know what, we really do need to replace this thing. So once again, uh, I list here that you know we had this weird combination of factors. You know, we wanted it to be schemaless in white column. We had high query volume. We wanted to do a lot of frequent writes. Right, so we wanted the data to be fresh. Still, nothing was quite there. A lot of the big data systems fit most of these, but when they would talk about low latency queries, they would sometimes mean seconds or tens of seconds. And our existing Caswell thing was more like fractional seconds to do a query. Snowflake came pretty close, but even it wasn't a good fit. And I only mention that right now because, um, you know, if this is a, a way for people to learn about how we did our process, yes, that was a failed path, but we did identify things that Snowflake did do well, and we did adapt it for some of our internal use cases. So you just never know what kind of things you're going to find when you're, when you're searching for a solution. In this case, our fundamental problem was the word database. Um, even today, if you go to Wikipedia and look at like wide column databases, I don't think that Redis appears, uh, which, you know, boo on that because it's not really accurate. So our solution is now to rewrite Casco on top of Redis. But how do we figure that out if I wasn't searching for databases? You know, you never know what kind of serendipity there is in life. In this case, I was out to dinner with a, um, one, a company that's a major investor in ours, in ours and is a partner. And I was sitting next to one of the developers and I was describing the woes of my problems. And he's like, you know what? You should really check out Redis. It screams. And, um, you know, starting then, it was a bit of a roller coaster. I would uh, start to read the docs and I would find one of the data structures that uh, Redis provides, like hyperlog log. And be like, oh, that's awesome. That might solve our problem. But it's like, oh, no, it doesn't do that. Or, oh, sets. Oh, that's cool. Uh, no, not quite. And then there was like Redis search, but oh, there's a limit on the number of fields. So it was like back and forth and back and forth. The most recent development was the announcement of Reddit Gears. And then I was like, huh, I had already researched all these other data structures. The main problem was that they needed to be orchestrated. And I was like, well, that's kind of what Redis Gears is going to provide. And to go to the punchline, um, I was able to turn that kind of thing into a drop in replacement. Um, and the ingredients involved are a combination of sets and sorted sets for inverted indexes. And then Redis Gears orchestrates parsing our queries, updating the various data structures on writes, and then doing various um, like set operations, intersects, unions, and diffs on the read side. How do we actually do it? Well, it's sort of a crawl, uh, walk, run metaphor I'm going to go into. Uh, at the end, I'll have a link to a GitHub repo with much more details on this, but um, I'll just talk through it for now. So, you know, crawl is sort of like the hello world step. And this is me just rolling up my sleeves, um, finding some information on the internet, um, kind of like Docker up, read a CLI, insert some rows, and then figure out the very basics of how to use gears to have a something called a keys reader, which basically just enumerates all the, the key values in the database, filtering them and aggregating them. And you know what? I got out correct answers. Um, not the most efficient way to go about it. Um, so then I was like, well, 
because I had at that point sorted everything into hashes. I was like, well, look, if I use sets as inverted indexes, you know, I, I should probably be, I should be able to skip this full table scan. And sure enough, with very little additional code in the gears, that worked too. And you know, I scaled that up even to just like kind of a couple thousand rows. And you know, at that point, I was like, well, maybe this will work. So I made a call. Um, so at this point, I had talked to uh, Redis Labs, and we figured out. Um, the next best step would probably be something like a paid POC. In this case, they provided me um, with this, I think it was in the, um, the Google Cloud, and it was like um, through a web interface, and I had access to like this three shard cluster, and another tab had like VS code. Uh, insights is like the Redis Labs Insights thing that lets you see things inside the database, and Grafana for some of the external metrics. And you know, this routine ac uh, access to the experts. I was still like mainly the developer to this. They provided a couple code snippets to get me going on a couple things, but, but mainly I was still doing, doing things on my own. Um, at this point, I um, decided to port, we have a custom grammar. Um, uh, it's called SQL, CQL, Caswell Query Language, because you know there's nothing like a homonym to add clarity to something, right? Um, but in any case, by being able to parse uh, SQL in Python, which Python is what Gears runs on, uh, we have the ability to have objects in there. And from objects, I can abstract away a lot of the um, complexity of how to mutate Redis uh, by updating various data structures, or uh, again, do the various set operations. Um, so with uh, Redis Labs help, we were to scale that solution up to maybe a couple million rows. And I was getting more and more confident, obviously, but the trick is, is that Gears, how to word this, it, um, all the other Redis operations are fairly well defined in terms of um, memory use and runtime, whether they're O1, ON, and you kind of know what ON and N mean. Gears can do lots of different things in every different call. so. So there's a variable amount of work done. And in our case, we have simple queries and heavy queries. And so like it was hard for me to figure out if it really was going to be um, fast enough, basically. So then came the run step. So the run step was, how about we just test in production? Because you know what could possibly go wrong? And I'm not crazy. We didn't actually test in production. I mean, we kind of did. Um, you know, we're in the Amazon cloud and we can do like fun stuff uh, because of, of all the virtualization involved. So in this case, I was able to create an enterprise cluster. I was able to do an export of our existing system and import it into Redis. And then um, we have the kind of thing where we have like lots of logging moving around. In this case, I forked the Cascabel query stream, threw it into a queue, and then uh, used various background processes to feed that queue into Redis. The basic idea being, if the queue stays empty, we're good. Um, and it wasn't. I mean, and we knew that. Uh, not all of the queries that I had figured out through that um, walk style POC were hitting all the indexes in the ways I wanted. So, you know, add a lot of logging, do some work, do a lot of talking. Uh, Mir was great. He uh, pointed me out to the fact that sorted sets uh, would be a nice natural way to solve um, our high cardinality problem, which I haven't even talked about yet. But, you know, as you saw earlier, we have the insight store and questions, and questions basically lend themselves to being low cardinality. A question has a small, finite number of possibilities to it. But we also want to have time and be able to chunk things up by time or have time series and stuff like that. So low cardinality and hard cardinality didn't really play well together, but sorted sets kind of came to the rescue. Um, and we got through that, and we soaked the solution for days, I think maybe even a week. And what were the results? Well, pretty good. By the end of the POC, we were at least as fast. And I mean, it could all be much faster. I mean, there was just no queue backups, and the cluster was in no way redlining by any means. The one thing that I do know is that um, compared to the old Cascale cluster, I could jam data in roughly 24 times faster. Now, this might make some people cringe uh, because lines of code is generally speaking a terrible way to, to have a metric on something. No developer wants to be judged based on lines of code. But I will say that uh, when I compared the old Cascaball repository written in Java to the, to the Redis uh, Gears repository, there was like six times less of code less code. And you know, to some degree, that makes sense. Cast the old Cascade on Java had to be a database itself and had to manage things with memory and files and, and stuff like that. And, and Gears does not. We, we kind of get some of that for free, obviously, um, which is the point. But I, I think it is indicative that, you know, if nothing else, less code to maintain is less cognitive uh, complexity on, on our developers. And we got a whole bunch of stuff for free. I mean, you know, Redis is a well-established enterprise system, so there's no known scaling limits. We have a ton of metrics coming out, better tooling, and you know, being a commercial customer, all the support. Uh, at this point, we're sort of in the next step phase. We're um, 
potentially live in production at this point in the future. Uh, at this point, we've been productizing things from that last uh, test and prod round. There was a couple missing features. We, we didn't do query caching um, or virtual shards, which I will talk about in a minute. Um, and then, honestly, the wheels are spinning internally. Uh, one major one is is the effect of the fact that we're you know running code inside of a database and this is not like a stored procedure this is you know anything you want and you know we do a lot of things with um modeling and, and like look like modeling and machine learning and the idea is that we could literally have like virtual columns where like uh the um respondent has has um attributes associated with them based upon you know a model which is a pretty cool idea for us um I mentioned that I was going to mention virtual shards. So Redis itself is, is sharded. Um, the individual operations, even within gears, are, are somewhat atomic. And in our case, we had around 4 million um, respondents per shard. Uh, so operations that would be doing a set like union that would be over all 4 million would could lock up for several seconds. Um, so rather than scaling that up by adding more and more physical shards, we could sort of sub shard within the shard to break up that four second lock into like quarter second locks or something to allow other traffic to get through. Um, so here we are near the end. Uh, key learnings takeaways. You know, honestly, get Redis Labs involved early. I mean, um, I mentioned there was the crawl phase, you know, right up front there, mirror. I was at that point, I had code in gears that was correct, but wasn't taking the um, distributed nature and the shards in, into account. And he's like, no, don't do that. You know, if you don't start doing the distributed logic up front, you know, it, it's never going to work basically. And I think he was right. I mean, it, it changed the way the code is structured. And ironically now, uh, when you're developing it, you have no idea potentially that the shards exist around you, but by having the right uh, objects in place and the right um, abstractions, it sort of hid that complexity. And that, that was a good that was a good tip. Um, another one is, um, and this one might be subtle to just say on a PowerPoint, but it's nice to be able to unit test your code with things like code coverage. That's like not a very complicated statement to make, right? So in this case, what's going on is that the way that Gears interacts with Redis, the API calls are the same as being an external client to Redis, talking to Redis from the outside. So basically, my tip is in your Gears repo to um, treat interacting with Redis via a proxy, where you could drop in the Gears implementation, which is running inside of Redis, or you could drop in an actual external Redis client. Then you can do Docker up on just a normal Redis server and then run your code. And it all still works just the same as it would running on the inside, except now you're able to run the code locally and do these things like code coverage. Um, another one kind of implicitly came up in my talk where uh, I've seen a metric tossed around about like 25K ops per second as a useful metric for estimating how many shards you need. Um, kind of breaks down a little bit with gears because there's a variable amount of work. So, you know, again, you need some way of like amortizing your estimates or having some sort of simulation. I obviously went the simulation route. And uh, down there's the link, github.com slash civic science slash redisconf 2021. I have like little teeny code snippets and much more details on um, the structure of, of the sort of crawl, walk, run implementation that we had done. So thank you. Thank <music> you.